Hi guys, this is Miss Wilson. Uh, remember today in class we were talking about environmental worldviews. So what we're going to go ahead and be starting now is getting into this chapter two where we're talking about in the environment in terms of economics and policies and ethics that go along with it. And it all comes from that worldview kind of point of view. So one of the things that we're going to talk about today are environmental economics. And remember when we talked about worldviews in class today, one of the ones we mentioned was an anthropocentric worldview where they're focused on humans. And that's really what you're seeing when we talk about economics is they usually look at it from a very human point of view. It's not a coincidence that economics and ecology start with the same prefix. We're, we're talking about natural systems and the environment that we live in. It's just a slightly different type of environment that they're talking about. So there are three major types of economic resources that economists will usually discuss. Natural resources, manufactured resources, and human resources. And all of these come together to form what we call goods and services. So goods would be products that we could purchase. Services would be things that occur um, for us, things that provide us with a um, method of doing things. All right. So in an economic system, um, if it's a pure free market system, that means that the buyers and the sellers are interacting with each other and it's purely based on competition. There's no government interference at all. Actual capitalist market systems like the one that we're in is not quite like this because they do have some government regulation and oversight. So if you take a look at the models that we use in either of these free market or these capitalist systems, they're based on supply and demand. You want to get the optimal price that is going to make you the most money, uh, but that depends on the demand for your goods. So it, it may change as time goes on. Now that supply and demand also comes back to your resources in the environment. So this is kind of a model that a lot of people use um, to describe this system. And one of the things that I want you to notice here is we have the source, um, which is where the raw materials are coming from. Uh, and then we have sinks at the end. We're going to talk a lot about sources and sinks this year. The sink is what receives the waste at the end. So that's really where the pollutants are going. So here's your connections to the environment. And then the economy is what kind of what comes in between. So people harvest the raw materials from the sources. They use those to then produce a marketable product. And then as people buy those products, the money travels from the consumer to the producer. Uh, the producer provides a product for that consumer. And then by consuming it, there's usually a waste product involved. Sometimes that comes from the production end of things too. And then that waste product has to go somewhere. So that winds up in whatever the sink is for that area. So here's another way to look at it. The natural ca capital is another word for all the resources that come from nature. So all of these different things that are goods or services. And then again, we go into that pr production consumption loop and we have these sinks that come out, this waste product. And di waste can look like a lot of different things. So these are some different examples here of those waste products. Now, there is always an option that some of the waste product might be able to be recycled or reused, which of course we want to do as much as possible. So then in that case, it would kind of cycle back to the natural capital again. Just one more picture here, and what I like about this is it shows you the difference between the goods and the services. So the goods are those natural resources, uh, those things that nature is providing for us to start um, making our products. But then the services are also really important. These are services that nature is providing for free that if we didn't have them, we would have to take care of it and it would cost money. So there are things you might not always think about, but things like water purification, soil formation, the cycling of nutrients, pollination. These are all things that if nature didn't do it, we would have to pay to do it on our own. So that's the services side of things. So most economists, again, are going to be trying for that anthropocentric point of view, but sometimes they will try to do it from a more eco 
um, ecologically sustainable point of view. Uh, and in that case, they're going to follow some of the same principles that we already talked about. You're generally safer when you copy nature. So these ecological economists are going to assume that our resources are limited. We want to um, make sure that we're using as environmentally friendly um, development plans as possible. And then we want to make sure that we're somehow accounting for any environmental or health effects um, that are going to be detrimental. So economists tend to try to put a value on everything. We want to know what the cost is. Um, and that is known as the utility, the value, the uh, benefits that people get from those goods and services is their economic utility. Um, so there's lots of different types of values. There's a value from actually using these things, or there's what we call non-use values as well. Um, so there may be things that are easier to put a dollar sign on. Those are usually the use values. The non-use values are a little bit more difficult to pinpoint sometimes. Um, and these could also kind of be referred to as non-market values. So these aren't things that are always included in a price, although maybe they should be. But these are things like, does everything kind of have a right to exist? That's called an existence value. Um, option values are, do we have other options in case we need kind of a, a second chance? Aesthetic value is beauty and the enjoyment that you get out of seeing nature. And then of course there's educational value to spending time in nature, scientific value, study things, and we get a lot of our drugs and things like that from the natural world. And then of course there's a cultural value, and especially in many Native American um, cultures, this is a big part of their life. So all of these things add up to these non-market values, and it's very difficult to put a dollar sign on them. So when economists are doing um, their calculations, there's a couple important indices that they go by. One of them is the national income accounts. So those measure the total income of a country in a year. And the one that you should know about is the gross domestic product or GDP, um, which is the annual economic value of all the goods and services that are produced in that country. The problem with the GDP is that it doesn't really take any of the harmful effects of those waste products um, into account. It's really just measuring income. It doesn't think about the sinks on the other side. Um, so because of that, we have to sometimes also pair this with other things. So one of those examples would be something called an environmental performance index. And that actually measures a country's commitment to their environmental problems and their resource management. And one thing that's a little troubling is the U.S., even though it has one of the higher GDPs, usually has a very low EPI compared to our other highly developed countries. So this is an area where we could certainly improve. So again, economists are trying to come up with all of these costs um, and put a dollar sign on everything, which is a very lengthy process that you don't need to concern yourself too much about. But once they have an amount, a cost, then they do what's called a cost-benefit analysis to kind of weigh things out and decide if things are worth it or not. Um, so especially when we're talking about environmental actions and regulations, we want to try to weigh what is the cost versus what is our potential uh, the positive outcomes of that. Um, and whenever they're doing this, they try to maximize what's called efficiency. So what that means is they want to get the biggest bang for their buck. They want to make sure that they get the most from their goods and services. They get the most possible money from those natural resources while causing the least harm to the natural resources in the pro process. So they want to find that sweet spot where they can get the most of best of both worlds. All right. Um, so one of the terms kind of associated with that, one of the things that they will look at is something called the marginal cost of pollution. And that basically means when we add a small amount of pollution, how much does that cost to our environment? And we're talking about the amount of damage to the environment. So we're usually talking about how much does that take away from those ecosystem services or how much does that take away from those natural resources, those goods. 
Um, sometimes this could also be a cost to human health. Uh, is it going to cost us more because now pe more people have asthma from the air pollution that was produced? You also look at marginal costs of abatement, which is if we add a, a small amount more pollution, what's that going to cost in order to uh, remove that pollution from the environment? So they put these two things together. And when they put these together, they look to find the optimal amount of pollution. So right where these things uh, cross, right where it doesn't cost as much to abate it, um, and it doesn't cost too much to the environment, that's our optimal amount of pollution. And that would be our most efficient um, method of using these goods and services. So that's what they're looking for. Now, one thing they have to be careful of is something called an externality, which is basically an indirect cost. So these are things that you wouldn't always think about. Um, they're effects that aren't always accounted for, but they're still costs to someone. And the example your book gives is if you have a soot producing factory right next to a dry cleaner sort of thing, um, then the soot from the factory could make it so that the clothes, even when they're just cleaned, come out with soot all over them. That implies a cost on the dry cleaner. So that's an externality because that's something that the factory doesn't actually pay for, but it's still hurting other people and it still is uh, causing a cost down the line. Those are different than the direct costs, which are easier to see. These are things that the factory itself is paying for. Um, so we have to consider both of these when we're thinking about the total cost of our app. So when economists are doing that cost-benefit analysis, one of the things that they should be examining is those externalities, trying to incorporate that into our costs. Um, so the problem with any type of economic analysis like this is that it's very, very difficult to assess how the quality of people's lives are changing and to assess all those non-market values that we talked about, like natural beauty and natural worth um, and how we're changing that. And what dollar sign do we actually put onto that? And the other problem with it is that we don't really consider any of those catastrophic environmental events when you do this either, uh, because it's hard to plan for those. You don't know when they're going to come up. You don't know how much they're going to cost. So these aren't systems that are without fail. Now, when once we have identified the cost, it becomes our job to figure out how to deal with it. So there are some strategies that we can use to deal with pollution. So this word emission refers to how much pollution you're putting out into the environment. And there's three ways basically to deal with that emission. You can set a maximum level of emission. You can require certain processes and procedures um, to be done by certain industries, or you can charge fees for emitting that waste. So command and control regulations are things that the EPA would put in place, the Environmental Protection Agency, to regulate the amount of emissions being put out. Um, and usually this requires using certain equipment meant to reduce your emissions. This tends to be very expensive and part of the reason why industries don't like it is it actually prevents them from developing more efficient solutions. They're mandated to use this solution so they can't even look for something that might actually work even better. Then there's incentive-based regulations and there's two major types of this, green taxes or environmental taxes and tradable permits which are also called market waste discharge permits. And either way, here you're kind of charging fees for emitting the waste. Um, and when you do this, um, if you have a tradable permit system, basically what you do is you identify the optimal level of pollution and then you divide that up and allow each company to pay for the amount that they are going to pollute the system. A green tax, on the other hand, usually goes to all citizens. So the rain tax would be an example of this. And the purpose of this is to make the individual polluters pay all the cost of their pollution. So I'm going to flip through these really quick. I want you to go back and pause and write down some of the disadvantages and advantages of these different types of pollution. All right. And then we'll talk more about these later in class. All right, I will see you tomorrow.
have a great night.